giver of every perfect thing, you be the glory, maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your word, King over all the universe, you be the glory. Good morning. My name's Kirk Scott. I'm one of the pastors here at Quest Church, and welcome on this, what's going to be a kind of a busy day here at Quest, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But first of all, we're glad you're at worship. Uh, Just kind of give you an idea, this will last service, will last about an hour. Uh, We've got three songs. Pastor Bill will be giving the message, and then we'll have a closing song. And and during that last song, if you have any need of prayer, we always have two people over here by the exit sign that would love to pray for you. So uh, please take advantage of that opportunity. Also in your bulletin is a Connect card, and uh, you know, it was interesting, I was talking to somebody not too long ago, and they'd been coming a long time, they're like, oh yeah, I filled it out when I was a first-time guest, but I haven't done it since. We really do like everybody to fill that out, even if you've been coming a long time. Uh, just, it's a way to kind of keep in touch with you, you can make changes on that card, and also on the back, you know, there's a prayer request that you can write down your praises and prayers and drop those in the box, and we pray over those every Tuesday. And there's a team that pray over those as well. If you happen to be a first-time guest, please fill it out. And we don't come visit you with that information. All we do is we send you a gift card in the mail to local Dairy Queen, just as a thank you for being with us here this morning. Um, A couple things I'll jump right into in the bulletin. There's really tons of information what's going on. But when I talked about the church being busy today, I mean, not only do we have the two worship services this morning, but then right afterwards, we're moving on to the Faith, Hope, and Love Day. Uh, that's something, we've been talking about that for the last three or four weeks here at the church. Uh, different churches in Bell Fountain kind of have always picked this day as a day to go out in the community and just love on the community. You know, go pray for people, go clean up parks, do different things in the community. And uh, this is our first time participating in it. And so here in West Liberty, our church, after second service, is going down here to the old high school. I don't know if any of you have been by that lately. Uh, it's just kind of grown up in some small trees and weeds and there's some, some wood that needs cut that they've put there. And so we're just going to, as a church, just kind of clean up. And we may have some people from Bell Fountain joining us as well. And if you signed up for that, again, try to be back for second service about 11.45 to noon. We'll leave from here and go right there. Um, if you didn't sign up, but that sounds like something you'd like to do today, I mean, we, you, we can use all the help because if you've been down there, it's kind of a mess down there. So the more hands, the merrier. So uh, if you'd like to join us, uh, that's the kind of stuff we're doing. Just bring gloves, long sleeve shirts, and those types of things. So also, next weekend, too, is the Invite a Friend weekend. Uh, that's that opportunity where if you have a coworker or a family member that you've been wanting to come to church, really make a special invitation to invite them. Uh, it's going to be a special day and, and with a few surprises, and so uh, we're just looking forward to, to that next week. Also, baptism. If anybody out here is, uh, I think we've got four, three or four, maybe five people that have one to be baptized, that we try to do those once a quarter. Uh, we are going to have baptism coming up here on the date of October 13th or 14th. If you have interest in that, or even if you're not sure and you have questions about that, talk to Pastor Bill, myself, or Mary, or uh, or even on Connect card, put on there that you are thinking about being baptized and want to talk to somebody about that. And that'll be that date. And finally, life groups. So we've been talking about life groups now for about the last three or four weeks. Uh, if you're a procrastinator, I don't, we don't have any procrastinators in here, do we? Uh, a few people might raise their hands. But anyways, if you are, this is kind of the last Sunday you for sign up with life groups. Now, could you send me a text on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday? Yes. Uh, but those groups actually start, I think the first group is this Wednesday. So next Sunday, they let them start and Thursday and those type of dates. So um, we basically have the sheets out there. You're welcome to sign up for them. And we just look forward to having all you folks join us. It's a great time to get connected with people, but also grow your faith as well. And so please uh, consider that. With that, I think that's it. Again, tons of other stuff in the bulletin. Check that out. But if now, if you'd please stand and we will continue worshiping. Well, we have gathered together with intention this morning. I hope you have came, I hope you've came to church with intention to receive from God, from the Holy Spirit, to give to each other and fellowship and in worship this morning as we Uh, Join our voices together. So I just encourage you to sing out. Join your voices. There's power when we declare the truth of God's word together. I 
it's all because of you, Jesus, that we're alive this morning in Christ. Our souls are alive. Amen. Giver of every breath, we lift your name. Giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity. Giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. It's all for you, Lord, maker of heaven and of earth. No one can comprehend your word. King over all the universe. You be the glory, and I'm alive because I'm alive in you. Here we go, and it's all because of Jesus I'm alive, and it's all because of the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raises dead man's life and it's all because jesus i'm alive sacrifice on the cross that we're alive this morning alive in Christ amen and so we say come Lord Jesus come thou fount of every blessing pour out your spirit on this place as we worship and as we sing your praises Lord
And you won't climb up coming after me. Man. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me.
lie you won't tear down coming after me amen Go and have a seat. Well, we're on already on week uh, five of the Gospel Project, and the Gospel Project again is uh, it's the curriculum that our young uh, people are going to be using, our, our children are going to be using for the next five years of Quest. And we said for the first five weeks we'll be on that journey with them, and then next week we're going to just continue our uh, a sermon series on Abraham, and then they're going to continue to go through the entire Bible in three years. So we've had good reports from the parents and from children on that, and we're excited about this new curriculum that we've uh, started here at Quest. And uh, I, I have to be honest, that what we're preaching about today is on the Tower of Babel. And uh, Jessica, our children's director, uh, came to me this week, and I said I was preaching on that, and she said, I don't think I've ever heard you preach on that. And I told her, no, I, I haven't. I know I haven't because I've never really wanted to preach on that book of the Bible, that part of the Bible. And it, the story, I'll be honest with you, it never did much for me. I didn't want to preach on it. I didn't care to preach about it. I thought it's this long story. I've read it before. I've heard it before. It doesn't really speak to me. But isn't it funny how God kind of takes you to the places? He kind of slowly shoves you to the places where you need to be. And sometimes he, he, he kind of shoves me into places I've never visited. Sometimes he kind of pulls me or shoves me into relationships that I've never had before. And sometimes he takes me places in the Bible that I need to address. So I'm here to repent. I read over this, looked over it. I really like this story now, and I'm a changed man. And uh, I'm kind of sorry for the attitude I've had all these years about the Tower of Babel, and it's really a great story. And it's not that long. I thought it was this long, long story. It's, not, it's only nine verses long. And I thought, wow, I've never realized that before. So uh, we're going to talk about that today. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I, th I thank you that you just continue to reveal new things in my life and, and change attitudes in my life that need to be changed. And I thank you for this story. I thank you how this story spoke into my life this week. And I pray it would speak into the lives of those that are present today as we look at your word. And we pray this and say this in your name. Amen. Well, the title of our message this morning is Scattered People, and you'll see why we have that title in just a few moments. But let's go back to, uh, to uh, last week, and uh, this is from uh, the book of Genesis, and it's from the story of Noah that we covered. And the Lord uh, said in his heart, and this is after the flood, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. So God says that, and we see in his, uh, the story of Noah last week, we talked about two things. We talked about God's judgment and God's grace and how those are really one part of God's character. It's not like good God, bad God. It's, it's his, his judgment and his grace always go together, and we're going to see that today in the story of the Tower of Babel. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your electronic devices, iPhones or whatever, if you want to just uh, turn to Genesis chapter 11, the first nine verses, and that has the whole entire story in it. We pick it up at a chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech, and that makes sense if all the world is descended from Noah and his three sons and three daughters-in-law and his wife, those eight people, they would share a common language and a common speech. And as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. And this is probably in the region just 50 miles like south of, of, of uh, Baghdad at the time, out in that general area. And they said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they used brick instead of stone, and they used tar for mortar. And this would have been a technological advancement at the time. And they didn't have stones to build with at that time where they were living. So they found this way to make these bricks, and it was very effective. And so, in fact, some of the brick structures that were created thousands of years ago, parts of those are still standing today. So the bricks they made were very strong. And then they would use tar as a mortar to hold the bricks together, and the tar also waterproofed the bricks. So it was a very efficient means of building. And then they said this. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower 
that reaches to the heavens. Now, the prevailing school of thought was that God just lived out of their reach, right? Lived right above the clouds. And the prevailing school of thought, again, was this. If we can build a tower high enough, we'll be up where God is. We'll be, if you want to look at it this way, almost equal to God with God. And see, they're using their technology for their own glory. When Noah got out of the ark, he stopped, and one of the first things he did is he built he built an altar to God to thank God for his provision. And so, so far in the Bible, we've seen these two massive, immense building projects so far. The first one was the ark that was constructed under God's director, direction and under God's uh, uh, blessing, right? God told Noah to build the ark, and Noah built it. And now we have this huge tower being built that God never wanted to be built in the first place. So the first, the ark was built for God's will. The tower is built for the glory of man. And in some ways, the, the humans at that time, and we never hear a specific name of any human in the story. The human race is talked about in generalities, and, and they're all kind of in this together, and they have formed, if you would, a rivalry with God. They want to become godlike. And this becomes a huge insult to God, and some other things they do in the next two verses becomes insults to God as well. And after that, they said, so that we may make a name for ourselves, right? Again, Noah built the altar to thank God. They're building this huge, immense, it would have been the biggest structure that ever existed up until that time. They want to make a name for themselves, and they're not doing this to thank God, to glorify God, to put their, their emphasis on God. None of that. It's all about them. And then they go on and say this, otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And we want to look at that comment again because that's the final straw and that's the thing that really goes against God's will. And what they were building, uh, this is a standing one. This is, uh, still exists today. It's near an air base, and it's called a ziggurat, and that's what they would build. They would build these structures that would go up tall as they could make them. They would really have no purpose other than to be this, this structure, and they believed that they would put a room at the top that God would, uh, one of their gods, or in this case, uh, they would want to be equal with God. At this room at the top, God would dwell there, and they would fill the insides in with, with brick and with, with uh, broken brick that they couldn't use in earth and things like that to give it stability. But uh, some of these are still standing today, and this is what it's something it probably might have looked like. So they're building it higher and higher and higher and higher. And again, let's look at that one statement, the third statement made there. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And avoiding getting scattered is good, right? And I would just want to talk about this a little bit. At first, it seems like, well, there's nothing wrong. They just want to kind of hang out together. And uh, first of all, there's safety in what? Numbers, right? There's safety in numbers. It makes sense to stay together. Secondly, there's more opportunities for trade in commerce, the more people that are gathered, that's how st cities broke up. You have more trade and commerce and bartering and things like that. It would make their lives easier. And we say this, the more the merrier, right? Get all the people together. It's funner, right? A party of 10 is better than a party of two. If you have a party of 20, that's even better. So the more the merrier. And then finally, bigger and better things can be built well, because why? We have all this, all this manpower together and we can work together to build this great tower. Unfortunately, they're working together to glorify themselves. But there's two things that they don't address here that really kind of distance them from God. And the first one is this. If they do these things, a lot of these things are going to make them less reliant on God and they're more reliant on themselves. But the final thing is this. They're deliberately disobeying God's commands. By not scattering out, by not going forth, they're deliberately disobeying God's commands. And I want to look at those. The first time God talks about spreading out is when he talks to Adam and Eve in the very first chapter of this book of Genesis. God blessed them, Adam and Eve, 
And he said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, take it over, spread out. That's what God said from the very beginning of the creation of humanity, spread out and subdue it. And then later on in the book of Genesis, he says this, to, uh, then God blessed Noah and his son saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. That sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? He repeats that and he says, fill the earth. Yeah, we want you to multiply, but we want you to spread out. I want you to fill the earth. And then finally, later on in this same chapter, he says about the same thing. God says, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Take over more land, more territory. This is what I want you to do. Well, let's go back to Genesis chapter 11. Now we're on verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord came down. See, no matter how high they would build that, guess what? God still has to come down. They could have built it twice as tall or 10 times as tall or 1,000 times as tall. It doesn't matter. We're never going to reach the level of God. So be, uh, in, in spite of their best efforts, the Bible says God came down. They're still nowhere close, and we will never be close to being God's equal. And the Lord said... If as one people speaking the same language they had begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. And God's not saying that they can do anything in the world. That's, that's not true. But he's saying anything that's going to go against my will, they can do. They can do the things I don't want them to do. And that's what God's concern is right now. And then in verse 7, God says, come, let us go down. There it is, go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. And he uses that plural of us, and it's used the plural form of, of, the, of, the, na of the noun or the pronoun used with the singular verb. And again, it's God saying, I exist as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God, three persons in one. So we see the, the presence of the Trinity there. Come, let us go down and do this. And then in verse 8, so the Lord scattered them, scattered them over all the earth, and they stopped building the city, the city that was going to glorify themselves, the city and the tower that they were building to make a name for themselves. That's why it's called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. From there, the Lord scattered, the author repeats it here, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And that's why we have different languages and different nationalities and different people groups today because of the scattering that was ordained by God. And when we think about what they were doing, they were trying to make a name for themselves. And you know, when I was thinking and praying over this, this, this part of the Bible, and I really feel God saying this, that speaking to me, and I think this story still speaks to us today, and the message is this. We need to use our lives to make a name for God, not to make a name for ourselves. And I can think of how many times in my life that when I've concentrated on myself and what I need and many ways making a name for myself, the problems that have arisen because of that. And there's four points I want to talk about under this, about making a name for God rather than making a name for ourselves. And the first one is this. If you're not making a name for God, you are by default making a name for yourself. And you say, hey, wait a second. I'm just a quiet person. I go about my life. I do my job. I don't bother people. I don't brag about what I do. I don't put any emphasis on myself. How in the world am I making a name for myself and not for God? Well, when people talk about you, even though you may try to fly under the radar and you just simply live life and do the things you're supposed to do, is God part of the conversation? Do they link you in your life to God? Do they, and sometimes they speak a, like a different language. If they don't go to church or whatever, they might say, well, that person's religious, which really in some ways is a compliment, right? That person's a religious or that person just, they're always talking about God or something like that. And sometimes it can be in a bad way, but oftentimes they're still associating us with God. And if I would go into your workplace, 
or I'd go into your immediate family or your extended family, or I'd go into your neighborhood, and when I would ask somebody about you in the first two minutes, do they mention that you know God, that you're a God, a person that, uh, that does God's will? Do they mention you and God in the same conversation or same sentence? If not, when people talk about you, they're talking about you and not about God. And what we should do, we should, people should see us, but they should see through us to God. And I remember I talked about this a, a few months ago. I called the person who, who, who led me to, to Christ, and I found out his number from somebody I went to high school with that stayed in contact with, and I gave him a call, and his name was Mark Gregor. I said, hey, Mark, my name's Bill Walker. I'm a pastor in Bell Fountain, Ohio, church planner. I've been here. Gave him all the background information. I said, you led me to Christ. You know, I think it was about what, almost probably... 30 years ago when I called him, or 30, you know, over 30 years ago, and, and all these things happened uh, close to probably 40 years ago, and, and I, I talked to him and about all these things, and I got, and he said, oh, and he was excited, and he said, thanks, and at the end of the conversation, I said, I want to ask you something. Do you remember who I was? And he said, no, I, I don't, and I didn't expect him to remember because he led me to Christ. I went to that youth group probably five or six times. I didn't expect him to remember me, and he didn't, but he was so excited because I was a Christian. And see, it was through him to Christ. And I didn't care. I mean, it would have been nice if you remember me say, oh, I knew you'd be a pastor someday, and I saw a lot of uh, ability in you, you know. But I didn't really expect him to, because it was all about, the emphasis was on God and about giving life to Christ. And he thanked me, said, hey, it made his day. Somebody he wasn't even aware of, it went through him to Christ. And that's what we need to do. We need to point people through us to Jesus Christ, and to God. Number two, don't allow your great plans to compete with God or his will for your life. You know, there's a difference between great plans and God plans. And God plans are better than any of the great plans that we can have. And I think of all the plans I've had in my life, and some of them have happened, and some of them have not, and I praise God that many of them have not happened, and I uh, I was going to be retired by this age. I should have been retired about five years ago. I was going to retire from the public school system, get in back then. It was 30 years. Now it's 35 and go on and do some stuff in retirement. I'm glad it didn't happen that way. I'm glad I am where I am today. I'm glad that God's plans interfered with my great plans in life. And we need to be the same. We need to kind of yield and constantly be sinking and saying, God, what's your plan for my life? What's your plan for me today? What's your plan for me at this church? What's your plan for my family and my spouse? What are your plans for my future? That's what we have to be all about. God plans, not our great plans. And when those two things coincide, when we can finally see our great plans lining up with God's plans, oh, that's the sweet spot in our lives, isn't it? A teacher recently asked this question. What are the things you want to do in the future, right? What are your great plans for your life? And a student responded, I just wanted to share this with you, and this kind of frames of, of how we act sometimes. And the person said this, get a girlfriend, kiss her, and then rule the world. <laughs> wow. Okay, anything else, you know? I don't know how old that person was that wrote her when it was written. They probably have two of the three done, but uh, that's what this person wanted to do, right? All oh, those are great plans. Those are great plans. And, and most, of them, uh, most of us have a, uh, get a boyfriend or a girlfriend eventually, and hopefully if uh, things go well, we're able to kiss them. But I don't know about the ruling the world. But uh, there's good plans and there are God plans. Number three, embla embrace the places and circumstances where God has scattered you. Embrace the places and the circumstances where God has scattered you. You know, he scattered us in a big way, like he scattered Mary and I to Logan County 12 years ago. We're glad he did. But where does God scatter us in our daily lives? And I think about this. I think of, uh, you know, of, of the hundreds of people that go to Quest Church and the hundreds of people that go to, uh, to, to church in this community and, and the thousands upon thousands upon ten thousands of relationships that we have every day, that we have with, with, with coworkers, with people in our neighborhoods, with family members, with somebody we meet in a restaurant, with the person that checks us out at Aldi or Walmart and just those, those interactions that we have. And why are we there, right? 
And, uh, you know, I've been really praying about this. I, you know, I, like I said, I've said this before. The first person that uh, a sermon is uh, preached to is myself. And we were serving at our daily bread. And um, I served, uh, I don't serve every time with them, but the, Mary said they were a little short. And so I came out and helped serve. And uh, I was there and I see this lady coloring after she had eaten. And I just sit down, sat down and she does this filling coloring that a lot of adults are doing. And man, she had some beautiful outwork. And I started talking to her and, and she said, uh, yeah, my, uh, my uh, mother and I used to color and my mother died and I color now, I think of her. And I sit on my porch and I color and then when it gets cold, I move in and I love it and I live with my son and, and I talk to her a little bit and I invited her to church. And I gave her, I had a card with me that said when our church was, and I don't know if she'll come, but, but at least I did it. At least I was aware of it for a change and, and normally I just would have sat around and relaxed, but God really spoke to me and said, Bill, you need to get out there. And, and the truth of the matter is I... Uh, I, I have less interaction with non-Christians than anybody here. All the people I work with are already saved. You know, they're, 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 they're saved. And uh, I need to put myself in situations and just being out at the store and look for where God has scattered me to on a daily basis. And sometimes I think, man, I, I think about uh, the people that, that work like at Honda. And man, what a, what a phenomenal ministry field that is. And sometimes I think, man, I, I wish I would have worked at Honda, right? I wish I would be on the assembly line, but I probably would only last about 20 minutes there. And uh, It'd probably be too much worth because I've heard how physically taxing that is. But what a great opportunity. Or if you work in one of the schools, or if you're a stay-at-home mom and you have other relationships with people, or if you're a student, man, if you're a student, just think of all the people that you're scattered to on a daily basis. If you're a teacher, all these opportunities that each one of us have. You know, several years ago, uh, I was a principal and I left that job. They got a new principal that following year, and he only made it through about two-thirds of the year. I don't know exactly what happened, but it didn't work out. And the enrollment of the school went down. The following year, it went down even more. So the second year after I left Fellowship Christian School in Cincinnati, Ohio, they closed the school. And there I was starting my third year of seminary, and the school was, had been closed. And I knew I was supposed to be in seminary, and I knew our family was supposed to be living down there in Nicholasville, Kentucky together, and it, it was a great transition. But, but yet I felt this, this, this heaviness in my heart, like uh, maybe I should have stayed. I knew that wasn't true, but what was going on? And I felt guilt. And I've said this before, guilt is never from what? Guilt is never from God. And then the, the, the husband of our librarian, his name is Dwayne Dw Dw Capellas, and her name was Myra. He said this to Myra, and Myra told me this later, and I think it was a God thing, but he said, hey, Myra, Maybe God allowed Fellowship Christian School to be closed down so all the staff and the students could go out into the world and have a bigger influence than they were just having at that school. Wow. That changed everything for me. And, and, and the guilt I felt that I should never have been feeling it was turned to joy. Maybe this was part of God's plan. Maybe not that God said, I'm just going to close this, but maybe God, and we know that all things happen for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his name. That's what the Bible tells us. Maybe God used that for his glory. The truth of the matter is we, we don't like to be scattered. We like to hunker down and stay where we are. Even the people that like to travel a lot always like to come home. And I think church people, I believe church people are the worst because church people, they want to just kind of camp out, don't they? Let me ask you this. How many of you are sitting almost, the, how many of you sit at the exact same spot where you sit every Sunday? You don't have to raise your hands. I can see it in your eyes, <laughs> right? Well, we do, right? We're creatures of habit. You know what I did too? I did, when we went to church, we sat in the same spot. And when you come in and somebody sit in your spot, it's like, you know? We do that. We're creatures of habit. And when we were here at, at Quest, we had just moved into the new building. We were growing, and it was time to go to two services. And we announced it, and we talked about it. One of the biggest surprises I ever had, people fought us on it. They didn't want to do it. They said, we won't all be together. What will do our community? We like all coming together. I'm like, well, what about the people in the community that aren't saved, that don't have a church home? What are we going to do about them? It's like, nah, we, we just want to stay together. We want to stay together. And finally, we, we did it anyway, right? And, and some people came back to me later and said, eh, maybe that was a mistake. I think we should have 
we should have expanded, right? We should have gone to two services. And then we went to three services. People were used to it. It was easy, right? But we like to hunker down. We don't like to be scattered. And then fourth and finally, bloom wherever you are planted. I've said this before, right? Bloom wherever you are planted. But I'm going to change that today. And we're going to say this, bloom wherever you are scattered, right? God has scattered all of us. Every single one of you has been scattered to different places. You have different relationships. Uh, you see different people than the person next to you, than me, than the person in front of you. We are all over the place in this county, in this general area, right? We are all scattered. The question is, are we going to bloom? Are we just going to be a seed that falls to the ground and dies? Are we going to bloom? Are we going to allow God to use us no matter where we're scattered to, no matter what circumstances we're scattered in? That's the key. And like I said, for me, it's harder than, you know, I'm around church people all the time. And I, you know, I looked at this and I just said, I need to be more intentional about reaching out to people that aren't Christians. I need to find other ways to hang out with people that haven't accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. One of my favorite authors is Oz Guinness. Guinness, He wrote a book called The Call. And he said this, The problem with Western Christians, ex-Christians in Europe and Canada, the United States, the problem with Christians is not that they aren't where they should be, but they aren't what they should be where they are. Wow. The problem with Christians is not that they aren't where they should be, but they aren't what they should be where they are. The problem isn't that we're we're not scattered. We are. The problem is we're not blooming where we've been scattered to. Well, oftentimes we talked about how the Old Testament is linked to the New Testament. And Jesus comes on the scene, and before uh, Jesus goes back into heaven, he's the risen Christ. Now he's been crucified. Three days later, later he, he rises from the dead. And shortly before he ascends back into heaven, he says a couple of things. And one of those is the Great Commission. He tells the disciples to go, right? Go, get scattered. Go and make disciples of all nations. And then he says something else, though. He says, before you go, he says one other thing. And I'm looking at Acts chapter 1, and I'm at verse uh, 4. He says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which we, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he says, I want you to go out, but before you go out, I want you to get the Spirit, because I'm leaving you. The Spirit's going to come, and I'm with you, but the Spirit's going to reside inside each one of you. And surely that's what happens. The Holy Spirit comes. Peter starts preaching. The disciples all have the Holy Spirit with them. Now Jesus is gone, but Jesus is really in their hearts through the Holy Spirit. And now uh, Peter starts preaching, and 3,000 people are saved. 3,000 people become Christians at that point, right? And now what should they be doing? Now it's time to go, right? They have the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, wait for the Holy Spirit and then go. Well, in chapter 2, verse 42, we hear this. They've devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to breaking of bread. And all the believers were together. They're all together, so they're not, they're not going out yet. And then chapter 4, verse 23. Peter and John get in prison, Right? And they share the gospel, and, and the people don't know what to do with them, and they're released, right? So, so, so Peter and John should then go out into the world and say, hey, we got out of prison, and tell the world about Jesus Christ. Well, here's what happens. On their release from jail, Peter and John went back to their own people. They weren't scattered. Those were the people that already accepted Christ. And then, then in chapter 5, uh, verse uh, 12, all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's, Solomon's uh, colonnade. They were still staying together. They weren't going out. Later on in verse 16, crowds gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. And this is happening throughout the book of Acts. See, now, because the people aren't going out and healing people, people are now coming to Jerusalem because they don't go out. And then later on in chapter 5, verse 42, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching. So they're staying in their own homes. They're still not going out over and over again. They're not scattering. And then in chapter 8, actually it's the end of chapter, through chapter 7, a person named Stephen starts to testify 
about Christ, and he really shares the gospel in a powerful way. And the reaction from the religious uh, officials at the time is they stoned Stephen to death, the first Christian killed for his faith, Stephen. And we're told this in chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles, who were basically the 12 disciples and a few others, all except the apostles, listen to this, were scattered through Judea and Samaria. Now they're scattered. It took the death of one of the Christians to get scattered. Now they're finally scattered. And let's look what happens. Three verses later, here's what happens. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Wow. That's what they were supposed to be doing. They were supposed to be scattered so they could share God with other people. And they didn't do it. And finally, finally, God scattered them. And some people think that, and I, theologically, I haven't, I'm not 100% on this, but uh, some people think that God allowed that persecution to happen to the early church so the church would spread out and go into the world. And that's exactly what happened. The question today is, does the scattering continue today? And the answer is, it does. If we allow it, we're being scattered. God has us to different places. He has you in places I could never get to. He has you in with relationships with people I might not ever know. He has you in relationships where he can use you more powerfully than he can use me. They say a pastor uses 80% of their effectiveness when they become a pastor. Why? I'm the paid professional. I'm expected to say that. You have a power. You have an influence. You have a way with other people I'll never have. Because why? Because you're not a pastor. That's not what you're supposed to say. They know when you speak, you speak from the heart. We just need to use that. We need to share the goodness and grace of gospel of, uh, and gospel of Jesus Christ with other people and invite to them into that saving relationship with Christ. And if that's you today, if... If you've never given your life to Christ, all you have to say is, God, I need you. I can't do this on your own. You're my own. I'm a sinner, and I need you. I need your grace. And then you simply turn your back on your sin. You cry out to Jesus, come into my life, take control of my life. I accept you Lord, as Lord and Savior. And if you do that, you're saved. You're a Christian. And you can immediately start scattering your faith with other people. And when you do that, we have people sign this board if they want at the end of the service. God has scattered us. He has plans for us. We just have to be willing to be used by him again for his goodness and grace and glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this body of believers. I thank you for your scattering, how you scattered the church in the world and how you scatter us as individuals today. Continue to use us, Father. Take us into places that we'd never go. Allow us to see and, and go into relationships we might not consider, Father. And allow us to have those conversations with people that they could see you and know you and ultimately give your life to Christ. And we pray this and say this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, stand as we sing our closing song. Oh, 